All right, so the second part of this lecture, all right, is going to entail covering pyruvate oxidation, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, we'll talk about some other uh, side topics towards the end all right, of this lecture. All right, but we're gonna focus on finishing up talking about cellular respiration. All right, so here we're going to look at pyruvate oxidation. All right, so in this case, this process occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria under aerobic conditions only. So, what's going on in this process? Well, recall that we've taken our glucose and we split it into two three carbon molecules called pyruvate or pyruvic acid and all this occurs out in the sisal all right so now this pyruvic acid has to be transported into the matrix of the mitochondria. All right, so once it's in the matrix of the mitochondria, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna have two key reactions that take place. You're going to have a decarboxylation reaction And you're going to have a dehydration reaction. All right, so to simplify those two terms. All right, so here you have a COO group at the end of the molecule of pyruvate. All right, this is a carboxyl group. All right, so remember your functional groups. Hence the name pyruvic acid because it has its carboxyl or carboxylic acid group, so pyruvate, pyruvic acid. All right, so this carboxyl group, you de carboxylate. This D is telling you that you are removing a carboxyl group. All right, so that's what's happening. So here in gray, you have your little carboxyl group. It gets plopped off of this molecule. And then you're left with here, CO2, all right? Carbon dioxide gas. Well, Next, you have a dehydration reaction. Or, sorry. Or dehydrogenation. Not dehydration, but dehydrogenation right, reaction. Where you're going to take electrons energy from the rest of this molecule all right which is acetate or an acetyl group you're going to take electrons from it and transfer those electrons to NAD plus well NAD plus is our little bitty electron carrier molecule 
All right, so when it picks up these electrons, it becomes NADH. It is reduced. All right, so once these electrons have been transferred to NAD plus forming NADH, you have another molecule called coenzyme A that comes in and is attached to this acetyl group. All right, so you have acetyl CoA as the product of pyruvate oxidation. During glycolysis, glucose is broken down to pyruvate. A two-carbon fragment of pyruvate is used to form acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle, which occurs in the mitochondrion. During the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, carbon dioxide, CO2, is produced and a molecule of NADH is formed. The two-carbon acetyl portion of the acetyl-CoA is transferred to a four-carbon molecule, producing a six-carbon compound. The COA carrier molecule is released. Carbon dioxide is then released from the six-carbon molecule, forming a five-carbon compound. In this step, hydrogen is removed and transferred to NAD plus to form NADH. Next, a second oxidation and decarboxylation occurs. Again, NADH and carbon dioxide are produced. In addition, a molecule of ATP is produced. As a result of these reactions, a four carbon molecule is formed in the Krebs cycle. Finally, the four carbon molecule is further oxidized and the hydrogens that are removed are used to form NADH and FADH2. These reactions regenerate the four carbon molecule that initially reacts with acetyl CoA. Each glucose molecule is broken down into two pyruvate molecules during glycolysis. Then each pyruvate is converted to acetyl CoA, which enters the Krebs cycle. Thus, for each glucose molecule, the Krebs cycle must complete two circuits to completely break down the two pyruvate molecules. All right, so <clears throat> during the citric acid cycle, all right, or the Krebs cycle, all right, this is where you have the complete oxidation of glucose into six molecules of CO2. So by this point in the process, you have extracted all the energy that you can out of the molecule of glucose in terms of usable free energy in that molecule. All right, so looking at the Krebs cycle. All right, so this process also occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria. It is also a aerobic process. All right, so there are two different types of reactions that take place during this Krebs cycle. All right, you have a dehydrogenation reaction like you had in the oxidation of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. You also have more decarboxylation reactions like you also had in the oxidation of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. All right, so 
here what you have is your acetyl-CoA molecule that enters the Krebs cycle. All right. The CoA component is cleaved off and the acetyl group is attached to oxaloacetate. All right, so the acetyl-CoA, the acetyl group, is two carbons. The oxaloacetate is four carbons. So you can yield a six carbon molecule here, all right, that we call citrate. All right, so during this process, the Krebs cycle, the two carbon atoms that were originally from your molecule of acetyl-CoA are going to be removed. All right, so your citrate molecule gets converted into this intermediate isocitrate, all right? And then here, this is where you have a dehydrogenation and a decarboxylation reaction. All right, so this dehydrogenation reaction, you have a, you have electrons, hydrogen atoms, that get transferred from isocitrate to NAD plus forming NADH. You also have the removal of a molecule of CO2. Alright. In the next step, all right, you have alpha ketoglutarate gets converted to succinyl CoA. Well, you have another dehydrogenation reaction and a decarboxylation reaction. Alright. So now you generate ATP through substrate level phosphorylation reactions. All right, so in this case, you have a phosphate group from guanosine triphosphate that's going to transfer the phosphate group to form ATP. All right, so you're left with succinate. All right, so succinate gets converted to fumarate. In this process, you have another dehydrogenation reaction where electrons, hydrogen atoms are transferred from succinate to FAD forming FADH2. And now the resulting molecule of fumarate is going to be converted back into oxaloacetate. All right. And you form another molecule of NADH in the process. All right, so for this particular pathway, you start off with acetyl-CoA oxaloacetate you start off with three NAD plus molecules, one FAD molecule. All right, ADP and inorganic phosphate. After a single acetyl-CoA molecule makes its way through this entire Krebs cycle. 
one turn. You end up with two CO2 molecules here and here, three NADHs here, here, and here, one FAD, H2 molecule, and one ATP. All right, that's only one acetyl-CoA molecule. Now, keep in mind, all right, you have glucose that you start off with, and through glycolysis, all right, we convert that to pyruvate, all right, which is three carbons. All right, now pyruvate gets converted to acetyl-CoA. Right. In the process, you remove a molecule of CO2 each. Now as acetyl-CoA, you remove two molecules of CO2 at the end of the Krebs cycle. All right, so you have your two here, your one here, your two here, and your one here. All right, so that adds up to six. All right, so this is where you have the complete oxidation of glucose to CO2. All right, and through this entire process, all the energy that you've captured through these dehydrogenation reactions All that energy has been transferred to your NADH molecule and FADH2. All right, so at the end of the Krebs cycle, all right, since so you have two molecules with acetyl CoA from, from one molecule of pyruvate, all right, or from each of the molecules of pyruvate, you have a total of four CO2 six NADHs, two FADH2s, and two ATP produced. Now this particular pathway, it's a cyclical biochemical pathway. All right, it replenishes itself. All right, so your acetyl-CoA molecule comes in, binds to its oxalacetate, you form citrate. Citrate is gonna be reconverted back into oxaloacetate. All right, so in this case, the citrate is recycled back into oxaloacetate. All right, this is what we refer to as a annual porotic pathway, all right, where one or more of your initial reactant molecules in the pathway is replenished at the end of the pathway. All right, so looking at where we are so far. All right, so we start off with glucose. We convert our glucose to pyruvate, to two molecules pyruvate. We produce some NADH, produced a little ATP. All right, pyruvate oxidation, we produce acetyl-CoA. We cleaved off two CO2 molecules, we produced a little bit more NADH. And then as acetyl-CoA entered the Krebs cycle, we produced more NADH and FADH2, a little bit of ATP, and completely oxidized the original glucose molecule into CO2. All right, so 
Alright, so what we've talked about so far is only this. Alright, we've talked about the oxidation of glucose to CO2. Alright, and the process of this oxidation reduction, oxidation of, of glucose to CO2 are electron carrier molecules. All this potential energy of losing electrons and losing hydrogen atoms, where are they gone? Well, they've gone to our electron carrier molecules. All right, so in this case, we have reduced NAD plus to NADH and reduced FAD to FADH2, all right? Because for every oxidation reaction, you have a reduction reaction. All right, so these are redox reactions. All right, so now we have all of these reduced electron carriers. All right, so now we're going to talk about where those electrons are going to go and how they're going to be used by the mitochondria. When glucose is oxidized during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, the coenzymes NAD plus and FAD are reduced to NADH plus H plus and FADH2. In the mitochondria, the electrons from NADH plus H plus are transferred to the electron carrier proteins and the protons are transferred across the membrane. As the electrons move from cytochrome to cytochrome down the electron transport chain, more protons are carried across the membrane. Cytochrome C transfers electrons to the cytochrome C oxidase complex. Protons are also transferred to the outside of the membrane by the cytochrome C oxidase complex. The cytochrome oxidase complex then transfers electrons from cytochrome C to oxygen, the terminal electron acceptor, and water is formed as the product. The transfer of protons generates a proton motive force across the membrane of the mitochondrion. Since membranes are impermeable to ions, the protons that re-enter the matrix pass through special proton channel proteins called ATP synthase. The energy derived from the movement of these protons is used to synthesize ATP from ADP and phosphate. Formation of ATP by this mechanism is referred to as oxidative phosphorylation. All right, so during oxidative phosphorylation, all right, what you're doing is you're tying together this process of chemiosmosis with your electron transport chain in order to make ATP. All right, so now all of this potential energy that we extracted from, all right, for instance, glucose, is now stored in our reduced electron carrier molecules. All right, so somehow we have to get the energy out of those electron carrier molecules and use that energy to make ATP. All right, in this case, your electron carriers donate electrons to the electron transport chain. All right, and this electron transport chain is tied together with the production of ATP. All right, so we have oxidative phosphorylation. All right, so this tells us two things. That term. Oxidative is telling you that some molecule on the way is going to be losing electrons, others are gaining. And this process is allowing for a phosphorylation reaction.
All right, specifically the phosphorylation reaction needed to make ATP. All right, so your electron transport chain is a series of membrane-bound proteins embedded in your inner membrane. All right, specifically, these infoldings of the inner membrane referred to as cristae. All right, so this increases the surface area of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. All right. Now, as these electrons are transferred to your membrane proteins, your electron carrier proteins, or your electron um, train proteins, they are going to basically shuttle electrons from one to the next. It's a chain. All right, it's like individuals lining up in a line, passing buckets down the line. All right, when you accept the bucket, you are reduced. The person who passed you the bucket and they give it up to you is oxidized. All right, and it continues from one individual to the next. All right, so you alternate between reduced and oxidized states. And as these electrons move down these membrane proteins, the amount of free energy stored in those electrons is going to decrease. We're at the very end of the chain, all right? Their very last person, very last individual at the end of the chain for aerobic cellular respiration is oxygen. All right, so when oxygen picks up the electrons, it's reduced to water. All right, so <clears throat> you have your electron carrier molecules giving up their electrons to your electron transport chain. These proteins in the inner membrane, they're referred to as cytochromes. All right, and there's all different types. All right, but collectively we'll call them cytochrome proteins. Now, the electron transport chain, all right, it does not generate ATP directly. All right, this is a indirect process of generating ATP. All right, we'll get to how that is over the next couple of slides. All right, so here you have one, two, three, four membrane proteins. It's actually more than just one protein per complex. All right, there are many proteins that make up complex one, complex two, complex three, complex four. All right. All right, but here, notice that on the y-axis, you have the amount of free energy, all right, in kilocalories per mole. And as you go down the electron transport chain, all right, your NADH molecule, which is initially is reduced, all right, gives up electrons to the first electron membrane cytochrome protein. And when it goes up this electron or electrons it becomes oxidized back to NAD+. Your membrane protein, when it accepts these electrons, it becomes reduced. <clears throat> 
right, well, next, FADH2 transfers its electrons, its hydrogen atoms, to this next complex, complex 2. All right, FADH2 initially is reduced. It gives up its electrons. It's oxidized back to FAD. Your membrane protein becomes reduced. Now, these electrons are then shuttled to the third membrane cytochrome protein. All right, so in this case, these are reduced initially. All right, this one is initially oxidized. All right, and when complex one is reduced and complex two is reduced, gives up its electrons to complex three, complex three becomes reduced. All right, complex three then shuttles its electrons to complex four. Complex four becomes reduced. Complex three will then become oxidized. All right, so it's a chain of redox reactions. And finally, these electrons that we start off here and here, end up down here, are finally donated to oxygen to form water. Oxygen is oxidized, water is reduced. All right, so in this case, the final electron acceptor, all right, and the electron transport chain is oxygen. When you're talking about aerobic cellular respiration. All right, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. All right, the amount of potential energy, free energy, decreases over time as the electrons are passed from one membrane protein to the next. Now, these electrons, as they're passed from one membrane protein to the next, all right, you're losing energy. Well, what's going on? Why are you seeing a loss of energy? Well, that energy is being used to do some kind of work. Okay, which we'll talk about over the next couple of slides. Now, at this point in time, we have talked about the second reaction, all right, where we have six oxygen yielding six molecules of water. All right, so going back to our chemical reaction for cellular respiration, the oxygen and the water. The oxygen is reduced to water. All right, well, that takes place here at the end of the electron transport chain. All right, so now we've talked about the two major parts of that chemical reaction. All right, the last part we have to talk about is the production of ATP. All right, so <clears throat> as these electrons are being passed from one cytochrome protein to the next, from one protein complex to the next, in these redox reactions, what you actually have is the potential energy in those electrons is being used to pump protons or hydrogen ions from the mitochondrial matrix to the inner membrane space. So, in this case, that energy in the electrons is the energy that's driving the movement of these protons, is allowing for these protons to be pumped. All right, across the inner membrane into the inner membrane space. All right, so in this case, you're going against 
a concentration gradient. All right, so if you recall that ions, ions do not cross cellular membranes. All right, if you're talking about a healthy, intact cell membrane, the ions don't cross by themselves. All right, because the cell membrane itself is impermeable to ions. Now, what does happen is these protons will pass back through a protein complex referred to as ATP synthase. Well, ATP is what we want to make, and synthase is involved in the synthesis of ATP. All right, so in this case, you're coupling the exergonic movement of protons down their concentration gradient to generate ATP. All right, so you're using the energy of this gradient to drive cellular work, which is used to make ATP. All right, so let's look at these, these things in one big picture. All right, so here, all right, we have NADH. which is, at this point in the game, is reduced. All right, it gives up its electrons to the first protein complex. NADH is oxidized to NAD+. Your protein complex becomes reduced when it accepts these electrons. And when this, take, when this occurs, the energy in that electron, and this redox reaction, this transfer, allows for protons to be pumped into this inner membrane space across the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Right. Next, FADH2 transfers its electrons to complex 2. FADH2 is oxidized FAD, complex 2 is reduced. These electrons get shuttled to this little protein carrier in the membrane that accepts the electrons and then transfer them, transfer the, transfers them to the third complex. Right? Again, this third complex accepts these electrons, you have the movement of protons into the inner membrane space. Next, you have this cytochrome complex, complex four, that accepts the electrons from complex three. Again, you have the movement of protons across the membrane into the inner membrane space. And finally, these electrons get transferred to oxygen to form water. All right, so now we have built up a concentration of protons in this inner membrane space. All right, so positive outside, negative inside. There's a high concentration of protons outside than there are inside. All right, so now we're going to use a process of facilitated diffusion where we're moving these protons down their concentration gradient back into the matrix of the mitochondria. And this is coupled with the production 
of ATP. Alright, so here you have this membrane protein, which is your ATP synthase protein. Alright, so here you have a high concentration of protons, you have your protein. These protons get pumped through. As they get pumped through, they drive the energy needed to form ATP. All right, so to look at this a little bit closer, all right, high concentration protons here, low concentration here. All right, so we have the facilitated all right, diffusion of protons down their concentration gradient. This movement of protons is coupled with the phosphorylation of ADP forming ATP. All right, so oxidative phosphorylation. You have your redox reactions on this side, your oxidation reduction reactions, all right, coupled with phosphorylation, which occurs here to form ATP. All right, so you're coupling reduction and oxidation with the generation of ATP. You're basically taking the the energy that was originally stored in glucose. You've transferred this energy from glucose as it was completely oxidized to CO2. And you transferred this energy to mainly your electron carriers. Your electron carriers then transfer the same energy, the electrons, to your cytochrome proteins in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And as they are transferred to these cytochrome proteins, you have the movement of protons across the inner membrane into this inner membrane space, right, where you build up a concentration gradient of protons outside. Now this is coupled with the movement of these protons down their concentration gradient back into the matrix which is used to make ATP. Alright, so this is how the chemical energy, the chemical potential energy and food is used to generate ATP. As this mountain biker heads up the trail, the breakfast he ate this morning is being burned to power his bike ride. His breathing rate increases as his leg muscles demand more oxygen to burn more fuel. Let's zoom down to where this fuel is burned, our cells. Here, the blood vessel on the left delivers fuel and oxygen to a single muscle cell. In cellular respiration, energy in fuel is converted to ATP, shown here as starbursts. Most ATP is made in the cell's mitochondria. ATP powers the work of the cell, such as contraction. Let's take a closer look at how ATP is produced from a molecule of glucose, our fuel. Only the carbon skeleton is shown to keep things simple. The first step is called glycolysis, and it takes place outside the mitochondria. To begin the process, some energy has to be invested. Next, the molecule is split in half. Now, the molecule NAD+, an electron carrier, picks up electrons and hydrogen atoms from the carbon molecule, becoming NADH. Keep track of the electron carriers. They play an important role by transporting electrons.
All right, so one molecule of NADH. All right, can yield three ATP each. All right, one molecule of FADH2. All right, will yield only two ATP each. Now, why? Well, the reason for it is because here, look, the first complex, NADH transfers its electrons when it's reduced to complex one, which becomes reduced as NAD is oxidized to NAD plus, and you pump one electron across. Now, those electrons get shuttled to complex three, get another electron, get shuttled to complex four, another electron. All right, so you get three from NADH. Now, FADH2 transfers its electrons to complex two, which gets shuttled to complex three. You pump across one proton, two protons. So two from FADH2. All right, so when you do the math, You'll notice that when you're comparing glycolysis to pyruvate oxidation to the citric acid cycle, that a majority of the energy right, that's made, all right, that's stored in these electron carriers, all right, it's coming from the citric acid cycle. All right. The overall amount of ATP from oxidative phosphorylation is between 32 and 34 ATP. Now when we add that all up, you get between 36 and 38 ATP molecules made from one molecule of glucose. All right, so in terms of the stage of cell respiration that produces the most energy, the most ATP, oxidative phosphorylation. All right, so later on you'll <clears throat> you'll read about this process of regulating cellular respiration. All right, in your book, in your textbook, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and explain it now. All right, so. This process of regulation involves negative feedback inhibition. All right, so here, one of the regulatory molecules of this process is the overall end product of cell respiration, which is ATP. All right, so in this case, ATP can act like a negative regulator of glycolysis. All right, so here you have the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. All right, so an enzyme called phosphofructokinase. All right, so phospho phosphate kinase so you're phosphorylating something in this case you're phosphorylating fructose 6 phosphate all right so you're adding another phosphate group to that molecule all right so ATP combined to that enzyme you can actually s slow down and stop glycolysis all right, so you don't make any more pyruvate. 
citrate can also do the same thing. Citrate can build up in excess and inhibit the same enzyme and stop the process of making pyruvate. Now, you can also have a positive feedback mechanism. Right, you have something called adenosine monophosphate. All right, so it's a balancing act. All right, so here, You have two all right, scenarios. All right, so if ATP is low and you have high AMP, all right, that means the cell needs to ramp up glycolysis so that more pyruvate is made so that you can make more ATP. All right, but if you have way too much ATP and not enough AMP, all right, the cell is going to slow down this process of glycolysis. ATP becomes a negative regulator of glycolysis and slows it down. All right, so you can have both positive and negative feedback mechanisms in place to help regulate cellular respiration. All right, so <clears throat> there are different ways that the, this process of cellular respiration can be disrupted. All right, so we've already talked about that you can inactivate um, certain enzymes um, throughout cellular res respiration pathways and disrupt this process of making ATP. All right, so you could have uh, genetic disorders that result in faulty um, enzymes that are involved in different stages of cell respiration. Or, in this case, you could be exposed to toxins, poisons that somehow disrupt the function of the mitochondria. All right, so there are a couple ways this can happen. One, you can be exposed to some type of drug or toxin that blocks the electron transport chain. All right, in this case, you prevent the movement of electrons, all right, from one electron carrier to the next. To one membrane cytochrome protein to the next. So basically what you do is create this backlog, all right, and everything's basically stopped up. All right, it's like clogging a pipe. All right, it's a pathway. So if you stop one process, you basically put all the processes before it in kind of this state of not being able to go anywhere. All right, so they're all stalled. All right, so this is how, for instance, gases like cyanide and carbon monoxide are lethal. It's because they prevent the transfer of electrons from this little guy here, the cytochrome protein, to oxygen. All right, so if you're not transferring electrons at the end of the process to oxygen, forming water, all right, because the oxygen here is what we're breathing in, right? All right, so besides oxygen transferring, being transferred through red blood cells to different areas of the body, all right, here you're preventing the oxygen that's delivered to the mitochondria from doing its job. In this case, you don't transfer electrons to oxygen, all right, that gets stopped. Well. This gets stopped, transferring electrons from complex three to four, from complex two to three gets stopped, from one to two gets stopped, or 
one to three, sorry, gets stopped. And so everything gets stalled, backed up. So then you build up this excess of reduced electron carrier molecules. They can't do anything. All right, you can inhibit this enzyme, ATP synthase. All right, so oligomycin is a antifungal. All right, so if you disrupt the production of ATP synthase, you disrupt the production of making ATP. It doesn't matter that you've built up this proton gradient on the outside. You're not gonna make any ATP. And then lastly, you can <clears throat> have a drug like DMP, so dinitrophenol. All right, dinitrophenol is referred to as a uncoupler. All right, what it does is it uncouples. All right, your electron transport chain. All right, this idea of transferring electrons from one membrane protein to the next and building up this proton gradient from actually using that proton gradient to make ATP. In this case, the dinitrophenol phenols, what they do is they intercalate into the membrane and they make the membrane very leaky. All right, so now protons just pass right back through the inner membrane of the mitochondria. All right, they don't pass through this ATP synthase protein. All right, because now the membrane is permeable to them. All right, so now you're disrupting this proton gradient, which now is no longer being used to make ATP. Now, uncouplers can also be a good thing. All right, so in this case, looking at molecule called thermogenin, this protein functions as an uncoupler. All right, so here you have your thermogenin protein in the membrane. In this case, this thermogenin protein is gonna be found in what we call brown fat or brown adipose tissue. All right, which is completely different from white fat. All right, so look at the differences in the cellular structure, tissue structure of white fat to brown fat. White fat, large globules, of lipids are stored in white fat, the nucleus is smushed against the edge of the cell membrane. Okay. But in your brown fat cells, all right, you have a nucleus and tons of mitochondria. Well, these mitochondria have encouplers in their membrane. So organisms that hibernate, all right, have a higher proportion of brown fat. And in this case, the brown fat will take the energy from the food that these animals have been taking in their diet and storing prior to the winter. And here, that proton gradient will move through this uncoupler protein and as a result, you generate heat as opposed to generating ATP. Now you have mitochondria and other cells of the body that are making ATP, that's not a problem for the animal. But here, this is how these animals keep warm during the winter time. This is a form of non-shivering thermogenesis. It's a way that they can produce body heat. All right, so you have blood flow in to the brown fat cells, 
generates heat. This heat then gets transferred to other parts of the body, through the blood. 